coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. Yeah, it's the biggest fish per species. They took striped bass out of it, thankfully, um, two years ago, which is great. But they, it's the biggest fish per species. And then the winner, it's for a boat or a truck. So like the people from shore who get the biggest species have a chance to win a truck, a boat, and then vice versa. So it's like it's a huge deal on island. The whole island goes crazy. That was Abby Schuster taking us into the fishing derby. We're adding two new big time species into the queue today on the swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how are you doing today? Thanks for stopping by the show. Quick shout out uh, before we kick this off. Peter Moraz from Augusta, Georgia won the big Alaska trip giveaway and on the huge uh, gear pack that we had this year. Big high five, Peter. Uh, definitely appreciate uh, you joining. Anybody else who joined those giveaways, we're going to have more as we keep moving on this year. Today's episode is sponsored by Jackson Hole Fly Company. They design and manufacture their own high-quality rods, reels, gear, and over a 1,000 fly patterns. You can get 25% off your first order right now at jhflyco.com slash swing. Check them out right now, jhflyco.com slash swing. We'll also have a link in your uh, in the show notes or in the app you're listening to right now. We're also sponsored by Fish Hound Expeditions, putting together remote Alaska wilderness trips for that trip of a lifetime. We've talked a lot about those trips, and Adam just gave this one away to Peter. He was the outfitter who gave this trip away along with the gear. So definitely uh, appreciate that. If you want to check out Fish Hound right now, wetflyswing.com slash fishhound, F-I-S-H-H-O-U-N-D to connect with Adam and the crew right now. Abby Schuster takes us over to Martha's Vineyard to find out what false abacore, bonito, and stripers are all about in that area. She even shares some DIYing tips off the beach. So if you want to head out there and do it yourself, we talk about... uh, the island atmosphere, what Martha's Vineyard is all about, and uh, we get fired up as Abby takes us into the flats and talks about exactly the unique uh, atmosphere of fishing this area uh, off the flats. I think you're going to have a different perspective if you haven't heard or haven't heard about Martha's Vineyard, the detail of the fishing there, and I know I did after this episode, so I hope you uh, enjoy this one, so let's get into it. Without further ado, here we go. Abby Schuster from KismetOutfitters.com. How's it going, Abby? Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, coming on today to uh, dig into some on, uh, we're going to talk about Martha's Vineyard and some of the the species out there. There's a few that we haven't dug into deeply. We've, you know, we've talked about everything over the years, but we haven't gone in depth on some of the species that you fish for. Um, One of them that we're not going to go deep on is stripers, but we are going to talk about some of the other species. Before we jump into that and talk about what you do out there, uh, bring us back to fishing. How did you get into fly fishing at the start quickly? And then we'll take it into what you have going with your guide program. Um, I learned to fly fish when I was a baby out here on Martha's Vineyard, actually, from my dad. He uh, he taught me, he was a crazy fly fisherman, but he'd like bring me out on his shoulders and we'd wade out at night and just like so dangerous. But <laughs> <laughs> um, he got me, gave me the bug. And then I went to University of Montana where I was like, oh my gosh, people do this for a living. And then oh, nice. I went to guide school out there and just really put my eggs in one basket because I've been guiding since college. <laughs> so oh, thank right. God it's worked out. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So you went to the, and which guide school was that? Sweetwater Guide School. Oh yeah. 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 Sweetwater. Sweet. Yeah. That's one of the big, we we did a Sweetwater episode. A co- I spent a couple years back. I'll put a link in the show notes to that one. And, uh, and that one's come up. That's a great program, right? That one's a great, if, if somebody's new to it. Yeah, it was great. It helped me a lot. Like, I don't know, I was 20 years old. It was like small blonde chick from the East Coast trying to guide in Montana. So <laughs> it gave me some credibility. <laughs> right. What was that? What was the biggest challenge for a, a young a blonde uh, person in uh, Montana, like a female? What, what was that like being a guide starting out? It was a little bit of a shock to the system, I think. But uh, it's changed so much. There's a lot of female guides out there now. Um, yeah. But, you know, you just kind of had to learn to hold your own, I guess. <laughs> right, right. I said, yeah, people, so you get on, have a trip come in, people might not know necessarily. Were they booking trips like through a shop? Yeah, through a shop. I'd show up. They'd kind of like look around for the guide. And I was like, it's me. Oh, nice. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> 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 That's right. Well, the bottom line is, and we've, we've talked to, you know, obviously lots of guys on this over the years. And, you know, the ultimate thing is, right, getting them into fish. So it doesn't really matter, right, once you're delivering on. Is that kind of how it works? Oh, yeah. It was totally fine. Yeah. It yeah, yeah. was great, but pretty funny at first. 
That's good. So your dad is interesting because it has a similar uh, connection to me when I think about because my dad, when I was a kid, used to take me on his shoulders across the steelhead runs to get over to the the spot. And it was the same thing. It was like, wow, are we really crossing the swift uh, river to get, you know, <laughs> but he did it because, and I'm glad he did because it was back in the day when I was about the same age, you know, uh, probably. And, and uh, it just got me going on it. I mean, your dad, like talk about that. What, what's your dad? I mean, talk about his influence on your direction in your life. Well, his, the outdoors have been always um, pretty important to him, and he's like the most hyperactive person I've ever met. So he always is making sure we're getting out and after it. So it was good to grow up with that mentality because now I don't know any different, really. <laughs> yep. But um, yeah, just to teach the importance of the water and the fish and how it can bring you to such amazing places and introduce you to such cool people and that's what I wanted to do when I started Kismet and it's been awesome. So I'm really lucky. Yeah. When did you start uh, that? Um, well, when did you start the, your, the Kismet uh, Outfitters? I started in 2016 mm-hmm. as just a guide uh, service. There's just me. And then in 2000, June of 2020, impeccable timing, um, oh, yeah. I opened the fly shop on Martha's Vineyard. And so that this is my third summer with the shop and I have two other guides now. We were on two, three different boats, actually. So it's been great. It's been fun. Nice. So I didn't realize that. Yeah. So you have the fly shop. And is that the only fly shop out there? Yeah. There's two other, there's a few other tackle shops. They have like spin gear and bait and stuff. Um, but we're solely fly. Solely fly. So describe, I'm always interested in the fly shop, getting a little insight. And we could probably take a look at your website for photos. But describe that if you walk in the doors. What, 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 are, we, what are we looking at? Take us there a little bit. I feel proud of it because we totally built everything in it ourselves because it was COVID and I don't know. It's oh, wow. It's expensive to do that. Uh-huh. So um, we built this really cool rod rack with a piece of driftwood and we drilled holes in it. So the, it's fa- I can send photos to you guys. Oh, that'd be cool. Like, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, it's really, it's cool. We carry Thomas, we carry a bunch of different rod companies. Uh, Patagonia, Sims, Yeti, Fish Pond. So we have tons of different flies from local tires and bigger companies, and it's cool. It's a real, it's a, it's a small shop, but um, it's been really fun. And my whole goal with the shop was to kind of create a welcoming community. I think that was kind of one thing that I was missing in my fishing career in life was just like an open, welcome community and. That's the goal I want to create for the shop. People that have been fishing for a hundred years can come in and feel comfortable. And people that have just want to get into fly fishing and know nothing about it can come in and feel comfortable and, you know, just to create a positive space. Yeah, that's great. I don't want to go deep into like the women in fly fishing, but I'm curious on your perspective since you've created this amazing, right? A fly shop, a guide service. How has that been as you look over since you were a kid and, and the whole product? Do you see lots of changes more recently or throughout the whole period on kind of women and, and the impact and today? Um, I do see change, sort of. I mean, I do see change. I think like New England <laughs> and saltwater, um, I don't know. It's a different breed, maybe. I don't know. There's... Oh, really? So that's different than Montana. Quite a bit different. Yeah, I think Montana's a little more progressive in that way, actually. But now, now that I've been out here for a while, like, you know, I was young and I was new and people were very skeptical. Other guys are kind of skeptical, but yeah, now it's fine. Now it's good. Now, do you think it's easy, like, if a... Uh... You know, I always love to dig in a little bit because I have a couple of uh, young daughters, you know what I mean? And I'm always thinking like I'm the same uh-huh. thing. I want to get them, you know, I just want to have them to have a great opportunity to do whatever they want to do. But totally. I'm always interested in the fly fishing space because, you know what I mean? You've paved the way, right? You and others have paved the way that if they want to do that, they could. So I always love to get a perspective on what that looks like. But it sounds like you feel like, yeah, anybody can come in if you've, you know, you want to do it. You could, you can do it. You could be a guide. I think like my mentality was like, I'm not hurting anyone. I literally only do catch and release. Like I'm working hard. I just kind of put on horse blinders and just like put my head down and worked hard because you can get really caught up in like the negative energy that comes with, you know, being a female or being younger, being new or whatever they have. Um, And you can get really caught up in that. And I did for a little while and it's so hurtful and you're not doing anything wrong. You're just trying to, create a business. Yep. So I just put horse blinders on and worked hard and it's worked out. So thank God. Yep. Wow. Yeah. That's, I love that. Okay. So 
Well, let's uh, let's talk about you know where we're talking about here, Martha's Vineyard. So, for somebody you know listening now, we've probably most people have heard, like I said, but describe for somebody who hasn't been there. You got some flats fishing. Describe that and how it maybe is different than fishing saltwater anywhere else around the country or or world. I think we have one of the best fisheries in the world. It's so fun. Like as a guide that guides every day, I'm never burnt out at the end of the season. I'm like sad it's over because it's forever changing. So we have these amazing flats um, all around the island and you can wade them or do it via boat, which is um, pretty cool because it's not just it's not one dimensional. Um, and the flats are pretty much like May, June. This year, the flats issue is amazing. It was all the way till August. Um, and then again in the fall. And huge stripers come out on the flats. Like, huge. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and we're using, like, the same patterns we use down in Mexico, the Bahamas. Crab patterns, little shrimp. Um, clousers, of course, too. But it's really similar to bone fishing. Except mm-hmm. I think it's a little harder because bone fish are so, like, they're pretty chill. They're coming on the flat. You know, you can see them yep. for a while. Where stripers are like, they have like that East Coast mentality. Like, go, <laughs> go, go, go. Yeah. <laughs> they don't right. slow down. They show up pretty fast. You have to get, you know, a pretty good cast, maybe five, ten feet in front of them. One long strip to get their attention. And then, even then, when you get their attention, they can be pretty picky. But crab patterns, are, I think, are probably the most successful. They are crab patterns. Okay. And then what does, you know, just talk about, uh, you, so you have the fishery, the different species, talk about the species, walk us through, I think there's like the four species you have there you're focusing on. Yeah. So like end of April, May, um, striper schoolies and stripers will start to move in and then the blue fish will move in. Um, and that's like, we're really focusing on the flats and then also the rips because we get this incredible squ- uh, squid migration here. And so there's squid jumping out of the water, there's stripers jumping out of the water, blues everywhere. There's squid ink all over the water. It looks like it's like full oh, wow. seaweed, but it's just squid ink. It's so cool. Huh. Um, birds are diving. It's pretty, it's like you'll see stripers like surfing the waves. It's pretty Jeez. insane. So yeah, it's like, it's so beautiful. Um, and they're not really picky in the rips. And then you go to the rips or then you go to the flats and they're just like these snooty little fish that, won't eat necessarily um and they kind of change color so it's kind of two different species at that point even though it's the same and then as the summer progresses the blues and stripers will stay around and the bonito will come in and they usually come in like end of july um and they'll stick around all the way through the end of october this year has been a kind of a hard bonito year um for whatever reason and then the fall the false albacore come in and that's so fun and that's kind of the island's time because we have all four species in thick so it's oh, been wow. it's been great it's so fun so you have all four in that time in the fall everything's going like everything's out there yep everything's going it's still going i got it yesterday i'm guarding tomorrow like it's still still full on no kidding and then how long is this going how long is this going to go on my last trip i have booked this year is november 3rd but I'm just kind of waiting to see what happens because it kind of dies overnight. Like once the bait moves on, it's, you know, they're all migratory species, so um, they'll move on. But the last few years, like into November, but I try not to book into November unless I know the fish are going to be there just because it doesn't really seem fair. (laughs) Yeah. But through October, it's always good. It's always good. Oh, wow. And and what is the... So is Martha's Vineyard, is that, um, you know, for somebody that wanted to just go there, maybe it maybe even the DIY thing, go out there and go off the, the shores or something like that. Is that a duo? Are people doing that? Yeah, for sure. We have an amazing shore fishery. So we have a lot of beach permits and stuff so we can drive down the beach to get to more remote areas. So that's a really cool way to do it because you're really, you're not around anyone and you're just this incredible beach driving down. Um, but you can easily just come over on the ferry from Woods Hole and Honestly, like almost every beach produces fish. It's kind of crazy. It does. Really? So this is not a hard thing to do. You can just go out there and. No, like you're getting on the ferry and under the docks, you're seeing huge stripers. (laughs) It's so cool. 
This is really cool. Wow. So this is something that you don't necessarily, yeah, I mean, even have to have a guide. You could do your research, prepare, and like, what, what does that look like to get over there from, say, where are you coming? To, like, so if somebody was flying in, let's say from somewhere on the West Coast, where would they be flying into? And then how would they get to the, the actual island? Flying in is pretty easy, actually. They You can fly right into the island. Uh, it used oh, to be wow. pretty hard, but now there's a ton of flights that come in. And it's really like, actually not that expensive much more expensive sometimes it can be but if you watch it it's not always that expensive uh, so you can fly right into martha's vineyard or you can fly into boston and mm-hmm. i've done this so many times and there's a bus from the airport to the ferry it's an hour and a half it's so easy and then the ferry is a 45 minute ferry um from woods hole yeah so from woods hole right yeah. a lot of people will come just for the day and we'll pick them up at the ferry terminal um, or we have Airbnb above the shop. A lot of clients will stay there or there's like oh, tons nice. of hotels and stuff around as well. Wow. This sounds, yeah, you're making it sound easier than I thought, it, you know, this was going to be, so this is good. So you could, and do you get people from, I mean, like your clientele, are they coming from all over the country, all over the world or what's that look like? Yeah. A lot of people from uh, all over the world, really. Um, I used to guide out in Seattle. So some of my clients in Seattle have flown out here. Um, but yeah. They're coming from all over. And it's so nice. The airport now is way better than it used to be. So it's it's not too hard. Okay. And what about, I'm just looking at the map, doing the map thing. But uh, so like the Nantucket Island, what, what's the story out there? Is there, is there, are people out there doing anything around that island? Um, It's pretty far, Nantucket. Um, I mean, we've, it's kind of funny, actually. I've spent way more time in Patagonia than I have Nantucket, which is like ridiculous because it's, <laughs> so close um we fish the waters around there sometimes but it's pretty far out to get there it's like a two and a half hour ferry versus a 45 minute ferry oh right so there are ferries going out there yeah yeah there's ferries going out there there's a ferry going from martha's vineyard to nantucket as well um and so one of the places we fish is way squee which is like a rip that connects basically martha's vineyard to nantucket and so we fish those waters a lot there's it's great fishing, but actually stepping foot on the island, I don't do that often. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let, let's just take like the false abacord to look at here for a second. Um, you know, and again, you know, some of these, some people listening maybe have not have even thought about fishing for this species. What, what does that look like? Are you this one? Are you out there in the boat a little ways out or describe that a little bit? When's the best time to get and then what, what it looks like when you're out there fishing for them? My blood pressure just raised. <laughs> they really? They're such crazy fish. I'm like a psycho with them because no, they come right to shore. <laughs> like literally they can swim around your feet. It's insane, but they can swim up to 40 miles an hour. So they're super, super, super fast and they're super finicky and they're just crazy fish. Like they're just, they're cool. Cause they're very visual. So a lot of the time they eat off the surface, they push the bait to the surface and the oh, bait, nice. um, because the water tension can't get out, they're trapped. So they, so you're seeing them a lot of the time, but they're not like stripers necessarily where like they'll feed in one area. They um, are all over the place. So they'll be there and then they'll go down and be 500 yards away. Um, so my thing that I like to do is like kind of follow their pattern or like find their current line, the current line that they're working in and that the bait is in mm-hmm. and kind of go like, you know, cast into that because, Typically, you'll cast into them, they'll run 500 feet away or whatever, and then they'll make their way back. So if you can find that pattern without, like, running and gunning to them, um, that's a beneficial way to fish for them. Okay. And are you – yeah, you're in the boat. Yeah. Well, and from shore, too. I mean, they'll come right up to the beach. Like, a lot of the beaches, um, if there's a bit of a channel or a bit of a drop-off where they can push that bait against the shore – um, literally they're right at your feet. The benefit of the boat, I guess, is that you can just get to more places faster, you know? Okay. Of course. But, um, catching a false albacore from shore is like one of the coolest things in the world. It's yeah. so cool. It's definitely harder, but it's so cool. Yeah. What happens when they take it? What's the, fr- what, what do they do once they hit it? Oh my gosh. I had bruised ribs because I didn't move my reel fast enough. And the real seat hit my ribs. I literally couldn't lift my arm over my like shoulder for a few weeks. It was so painful. Oh, wow. Um, but they swim so fast. They'll bring you to your backing multiple, multiple times. 
Um, we're using nine or ten weights for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, intermediate, mostly sinking lines sometimes, just because you're stripping so fast that with the oh, sinking yeah. line, it doesn't actually like really get below the surface. It's still in that top water column, but um, it just gets it down a little bit faster. But they don't have swim bladders, so you really have to try and get them in as fast as you can so they you know, can go back strong and healthy. Um, so that's why I usually use the Thomas and Thomas Sexton 10 weight because it's, it's not that heavy of a rod, even though it's a 10 weight, so you can cast it all day. And um, yeah, it's you can just really get it in fast, which is fun. The cool, yeah. the hardest part though is they're pretty smart, I think, because sometimes they'll run right at you. And so I've had to throw the boat in reverse and clients had to run from the bow to the stern and they'll still get <laughs> off because they are running right at you. Or you can like put like when you know when you're fighting a tarp and you put your rod in the water. Yeah. Like you can do that as well. Because sometimes and sometimes there's nothing you can do to say run so fast at you that you can't keep tension. So that's a tricky part. Wow. So they're they're smart too. They're pretty smart as far as fish go. Yeah, they have amazing eyesight. They're tricky little things. Yeah, which is harder to catch out there during the season out of the four species, which is the dip most challenging? Probably albies. Um, stripers on the flats are more like hunting. You know, they're, it's hard because you're seeing them and stalking them and they're picky and it's so cool. But albies are just, there's sometimes, even though I'm out there guiding every day, Sometimes it seems like there's no rhyme or reason on what they're doing. <laughs> like, yeah. One day, yesterday, they're eating a little pink anchovy, and the next day, they won't touch that, and they eat a green, What you know, like, it's just... Yeah. So you kind of, every day, I mean, they're in their spots, and you get your groove, but yeah. some days gotcha. you can find them, and they're, you're casting at them, and they just won't eat anything, and you're like, what the yeah. hell? So it is good having a guide probably for this because they can be, yeah, you might get skunked one day trying to use the same thing you used the day before. Yeah, I think it's definitely good to have someone out on the, who's, you know, lives and breathes it. Yeah. It's all they care about is false albacore. So, I mean, that's definitely beneficial. Today's episode is sponsored by Country Financial. The fires in the Pacific Northwest and the West over the last uh, few years uh, have been devastating. Thousands of people uh, have lost their homes, belongings, and the sense of safety has been shaken up. Uh, We even had a guest, uh, Frank Moore, RIP Frank, uh, before he passed. uh, They lost their house in one of the big fires down there. So it's a tragic thing that's going on. And this is uh, another reason why insurance and protecting your assets is so important to understand what you need. Dalton, that country, was on the front lines during those fires, handing out checks to the uh, country community providing food, drinks, and a sense of, uh, of that community during this devastating disaster. Each time Dalton meets with a client, he does an extensive review of their current assets and coverage so you understand what you need, and he takes you through that journey. The unexpected will happen, so it's always best to make sure your assets are protected, and that's what Dalton specializes in. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash country, C-O-U-N-T-R-Y, right now to support this podcast and uh, and Dalton and his great uh, community he has going and get uh, some information on insurance. Okay, back to the show. I want to dig in a little more on the species too, but I want to take it to like a day in the, you know, the guide, you know, like if we were to come down there to fish, let's just say you're out there now, what does that look like? So if you have clients, um, take us to the start. What time are they, are they meeting you at the dock? How's that look? So we do a boat trip. It's everything's very really tide dependent. Um, Falls Albacore, you and Bonito don't fish super well at night. So unlike stripers and stuff, which you can fish all night. But so you're meeting during the day. I like to meet early. If depend, of course it's all tide based, but you know around six thirty or so. It's not that early, but just so you're getting there around the time the sun is coming up. Okay. And right when the sun rises, usually it turns on, and it's kind of crazy, like half the time we don't even leave the harbor yet and we're getting shots oh really so like at the dock everything like i show up every rod is rigged and ready like with the second you step foot on the boat you have to be ready to cast because it happens right sometimes in the harbor so you're really not going i mean you can go far but a lot of the time you're not you're not. And what is that? So if you're in the harbor, you got all the rods rigged up, you got your clients, you're like, all right, get ready. Are you 
what's the cast look like? What are they doing in the harbor, you know, harbor versus other areas? So it's not like I always say it's not, you know, the flats, you kind of have to have an accurate, good cast. Um, for Albies, I'm kind of like, forget all of that. Just get the fly out as fast as you can. My biggest pet peeve in the world is just like a thousand Voss cast. Cause I'm like, oh my God, yep. just please put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But they just like get the fly out as fast as you can. And the second that fly hits the water, tuck your, um, it's a two hand strip is what I like to do. So tuck your, the cork under your arm and start stripping. And a lot of the time, right when it hits the water, you'll get that hit because it's, it's a feeding frenzy when they're on the surface. Mm. So they're just, it's a blitz. They're just, they're going nuts. So you want that bait to be moving. Gotcha. And it's like as fast as possible. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because falls off a court. There's, they're so crazy. You'll get them on a dead drift sometimes too. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> but generally, the rule of thumb is as fast as you can strip, 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 because they have such good eyesight. Yeah. So you're just basically you see you see some action going on. You say, hey, get it out there. And how far does it matter? You're casting, say, you know, thirty feet versus sixty feet. So not really, um, especially in the boat. It re- you really don't have to cast super super far. Um, where the flats, you know, it's beneficial to be able to cast a little bit farther because they're so spooky. But when they're in that feeding frenzy, they don't notice much except for all the bait. So you can kind of get right up on them. And then as long as you're stripping and ready and, you know, when we get on the dock, I kind of go through it with everyone, like cast it out as fast as you can, strip it in and then get ready to set the hook and run backwards or Mm. put your rod tip in the water because they will typically run at you they will and how do you what's the hook set what do you tell them on this hook set big strip set as big as possible no trout i went trout fishing a few weeks ago and i strip set like 500 times i was like oh my god this guy <laughs> probably thinks there's something wrong with me because yeah. i couldn't do it and i get so mad at my clients that trout set. i'm like oh my god i'm worse than anyone <laughs> right it's a good taste of my own medicine that's right. How is the strip set on a I, on a trout? What if you do a strip set on it? Does that work? Nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, nothing happens, right? Yeah. Finally, the guy's like, you need to be on streamers. I'm like, yeah, I think so. I can't do this. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, <laughs> let's touch on, uh, and I, I do want to touch on a little bit on the trout too, just to round off kind of some of your background. But let's stick with Albies for a little bit. So let's go gear. So if somebody was going out there, is the gear different whether you're fishing you know, a DI, like somebody out there on the beach just coming in versus say on the boat or is it the same setup? Same setup. I probably wouldn't use, unless you're like fishing the channels um, or the jetties, you probably don't need sinking line from shore. I'd recommend intermediate. And then 16 or 20 pound fluorocarbon leader. If it's super, super calm, you can go down to 12, which is hard because they're pretty big fighting fish, but um sometimes they just won't eat if it's super super calm so what i like to do is just make a really long 16 pound liter or 20 okay and how long like 10 feet probably around okay on really calm days not super long but yeah long enough a little bit longer maybe on some days and what's your intermediate do you have a brand or line you like to use there we use a lot of different ones um i like airflow a lot the striper lines for Rio are good. We carry Cortland as well. We carry all of them. And oh yeah, yeah. We use all of them. They're great. SA lines are great. Um, yeah. But as long as it's a cold saltwater line, you're good. A cold saltwater line. Yep, exactly. And then I just think um, from short of stripping basket is a necessity because they pull so much. And I use it in the boat even sometimes too, but they pull your line out so fast that you really want to make sure it's not around your feet or on the rocks or in a shell or whatever. I mean, it will find anything to get wrapped around. So a stripping basket is really beneficial. Okay, perfect. And and then you sit on the rod, so you're just looking at a, uh, for the Albies, a, um, did you say like 10 weight? Yeah, nine or 10 weight. Um, a lot of the time I'll put people on. 10 weight. We fish Thomas and Thomas rods on our boat. So the sex tip is my favorite. Gotcha. And a good reel. What what about uh, reel? Uh, that's obviously an important one. Yeah, we use cheeky reels. They're great. Um, just make sure that drag is cranked down because they, especially if you're 
close to shore or rocks or in the harbor, um, you really want to have that drag down pretty hard. Right, right, because they're going to run. Okay, so so the gear is pretty standard, uh, and then flies, you mentioned a few. It's not, flies aren't super critical, just having a, it sounds like a diverse selection of different kind of baits to be using out there, imitating. Yeah, Albie is definitely usually smaller bait than um, stripers and bluefish. So you're really looking for like Bonito Bunny is a good fly. Anything like white, pink, or chartreuse. Sometimes when they just won't eat anything, you can just put on a teeny tiny deceiver, like the kind of mimics krill almost. Um, and that's the best fly. But little like gummy minnows can be good. Um, honestly, gotchas we catch a lot of fish on, which is pretty funny. But little, just little bait, little flies. Okay. All right. Well, sounds pretty standard. And then. And so, and then albies versus you talked about stripers. Talk about a little bit the other couple of species you're hitting. How, how are those different from what we talked about here with uh, with the other two? So blues um, are crazy. They're so fun. We get huge bluefish on the island, and they're so mean. They have huge, well, they have really sharp teeth. Like, they'll bite through your net and just, hmm. like, they're crazy. They're crazy. They're super, super strong. Um they are not as picky as stripers or bonito or albies. Um, I really like like bigger yellow flies for them, like um, like little mackerel patterns, big mm-hmm. deceivers, big clousers um, with a lot of movement. Same kind of thing that you um, use intermediate line. The one thing that is really helpful, Cortland makes this tie able, like it's a wire leader. Or tip it, sorry, or tip it. And you can just add that to the last like eight inches of your line. And that really helps because they'll bite through your line all day. Gotcha. So you need some bite wire on that. And what is a like size wise bluefish versus, well, I guess you can talk about all of them, but talk about blues. Like what's a, what's a good size and, or an average size blue? I mean, anything double digits for blue is huge. Like it feels like you're fighting a shark. They're so strong and they're just like pure muscle. And you're talking double digit, like in poundage. Yeah. Yep. So anything like, you know, 10, 12, 14 pounds is a big bluefish. Okay. And they're mean and they'll hang out in big schools. What what do you mean? So yeah. What do you mean by when you say mean, how does that mean like different from the other species out there? Well, they're just so, so aggressive and they, when they eat, they eat hard and then you reel it in and you, scoop them in your net and then they bite through your net and oh, they right. grow up all over your boat and then they try and bite you and oh, it's really? like they're crazy they try to bite yeah, you yeah i mean really? thank god they're not like 12 feet they would be dead. like you couldn't go swimming no kidding yeah they're crazy and you'll see them like on the flats sometimes but we don't target them on the flats like they don't cruise the flats really they're more in rips and like where the flat ends and the deeper waters and stuff i mean you'll see them on the eating on the surface but we're not really targeting them on the flats. Gotcha. So they're not the flats fish. They're the, they're the crazy uh, predator out there a little further. Yeah. And they're close. To, I mean, they're still super close to shore. They just, they don't typically eat in like two feet of water. Right. Typically. Gosh, this is good. Yeah. I was, you just reminded me about the eating. I, I was listening to another podcast episode. I can't remember who it was, but they were talking about, they were fishing for big like sharks on the fly and like a shark landed in the boat somehow and it like literally oh in the boat literally chased the guide up on his platform right um oh my God. yeah you know what i mean like it's like intensity because these fish are i mean there's they're predators and you're saying these blue fish are kind of not, not quite like that but they're safe they'll literally if you gave them a chance they'd probably try to bite you out of the water oh yeah they bite through nets and try and bite your toes like they're mean wow that's amazing okay you have to have pliers with you because like you cannot remove the hook with your hands you can't no you have to have flyers yep gotcha okay so so these are nice and then talk about the bonito now how are they how do they round out the four so the bonito are super cool they hang out with the albies um and stripers as well they have teeth as well and they're super super strong like albies um a lot of the time when you're fighting a bonito you don't necessarily know if it's a bonito or an alby they'll take off um the same way and they'll eat the same stuff, like a little bit smaller bait than stripers or bluefish, typically. Um, and they're super close to shore, too. Like, catching one from shore is so cool. 
Um, they're kind of funny fish in the way that like four years ago, there was insane Benito all over the place. Like clients that just learned to fly fish were casting and catching them. And it was unbelievable. And then like this year, for example, we've caught not that many at all. We oh, just really? pretty elusive this year. Yeah. So it varies on the year where I feel like Albies are pretty like, we know they're going to be here end of August through end of October. And like, we're targeting them every day. We're like Benito. We're targeting them, but you're not going to always see them. Gotcha. Gotcha. So there's, a, there's, yeah, obviously there's some migration stuff out there. Who knows what's going on with everything? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So you got the four. So what would it be, you know, let's just say early, late October, November, you know, I come in the shop, I'm coming over for like, you know, a day. I want to, I don't know much of what's going on. I just want to jump out. I got my gear. Um, what would you tell me if I came in the shop today and it was like, okay, what, what should I be doing? What, where would you direct me? I mean, so you could go either beach or shore this time of year. Um, because the water's cooled down, you know, in August, the shore fishing is pretty hard because it's so hot okay. that you really want to get to deeper water. And so, yeah, so you, I would say if you want to go from shore, you can definitely do that. And honestly, like any of the beaches, are great you're looking really for a place where there's moving current they're all very tide based these fish so you want the current not to be slack so it has it should be moving um and then typically anywhere with like a drop off Mm, is a good spot because the fish can then you know push the bait right to that drop off and a lot of our beaches there's a drop off five ten feet from shore oh wow so you don't even have to wait out that far yeah um and then they kind of like create a little like buffet line, really. Like they yep. push the bait against that that shelf, and you just want to cast over the shelf. Yep. If you're not seeing them, let it sink for a couple seconds, and then two hand strip in because albie stripers and bluefish will eat the two hand strip. Um, where typically stripe bonito and albies will not eat a one hand strip. If that makes sense. Mm. Because if you do a one-hand strip, the fly stops. Out, stripers really like that. If you do a two-hand strip, the fly never stops. So because Benito and Albies have such great eyesight, the not stopping is really beneficial. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's great. This is in, – and these species, there is, as you're speaking here, overlap between the two. But when you – or between the, all the species. But when you look at them, do, do you see from your perspective a lot more differences or a lot more similarities between everything we're talking about here? I mean, they're all eating the same, a lot of the same bait. Um, you can typically tell which you're casting at by how they break the water. Um, like Benito and false albacore are way more organized, I would say. Like they look like dolphin kind of when they're eating on the surface. They're porpoising like that. Where stripers and bluefish are just like messy predators and they're just bubbling and going crazy and it doesn't necessarily seem like there's a rhyme or reason to where they're coming up where like albies gotcha you can see them yeah in the direction they're moving they're very organized it's very cool yeah when you look at the species um you know it's interesting because they are saying like bonito and albacore just their body morphology and stuff is similar versus say the the stripers and the bluefish, they 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 look a lot different, but they're kind of different than the I don't know what you would even call right that fish. They're more streamlined, right? The the beninos are kind of the speed. They're like little torpedoes. That's why they're so fast. Yeah, they're the torpedoes. They have like like Albie's fins go into their body because they can swim so fast. So like they're literally like torpedoes. Yeah, they're amazing. Like stripers fins don't do that. They just like little slits. They go right in. Toot. Yeah. This is really cool. And then the coloration on it. Now, the Albies, they have some pretty amazing coloration, right? Do, do, does oh that change? God. Does that change throughout the season? No, they usually, they're pretty, um, they stay pretty much the same. Um, the only ones that colors that really change are stripers. If they're on the flats versus the rips, they'll turn like golden on the flats and they're darker blue green on the rips. But the Albies and Benito, they'll stay, um, they'll stay the same color. They're so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. They got, crazy like uh i don't know like lying on their back the squiggly lines and the colors it's just uh you're like camo yeah camo. Very in style that's what it is yeah that's the camo right because they're trying to stay away. well they're predators but they're also trying to keep from getting eaten too is that true yeah they it's actually really interesting um they don't know a ton about false albacore this year the american 
Solder Guide Association just started tagging Albies for the first time to try and figure out like where they go at night because they don't eat at night. Hmm. It's like the weird, like there's not that much um, research on them. I was on a board this winter and I was a conservation board and I asked the question like, why do, why is there not more research for Albies? Like people travel from all over the country to Martha's Inner to fish for false albacore. So like the hotels get business, the guides get business, the restaurants get business. There's so much economy behind them. But up until recently, they were, they weren't really, no one cared about them because you can't eat them. So there wasn't that much research on them until now. And you can't eat them just because they're so um, top of the food chain. They're bad. They're, Oh. They're just like really, it's like licking a dock. They're like, really? like they're like really like fishy, like oil. So you've tried them? You've tried them a few times? Well, I had one client that swore it tastes like bluefin tuna. And I was like, no, it does not. So he came into the shop with it. And I was like, oh God, it did not taste like bluefin it didn't. tuna. <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't think so at all. But it was so nice of him to bring it in and prove a point. But. Okay. I stand by. <laughs> so they're not good. What about what about the other ones? Are you able to are the other ones taste good at all? Yeah, Benito's delicious. Benito's amazing. Okay. Uh striper, I don't eat, but it's people eat it. It's good. And bluefish is very fishy. Okay. It's good. Um it's best smoked because it's very, very oily. Yeah. It's like a, oily. their meat is almost blue. Mm. It's like a it's a cool color, but it's very oily. Are you able to um like keep fish out there, any, any of these species? Yeah. Yeah, so people out there on the fly, like uh, keeping fish, taking them home. Um, oh, mostly not, but people do. Um, I don't keep any stripers. I don't like my clients to either. Yeah, just because they're way more valuable in the water than not to me. And but bonito sometimes they're really good. Um, black sea bass is another species oh, yeah. we get. We don't target a ton, but th- we'll keep those sometimes. They're really good. Mm. Um, but yeah. Bluefish is an acquired taste. Acquired taste. And is it a, um, you know, the area, so not only obviously you have the fly, but there's a whole industry, right? Is it, Do you see that out there where people are like going, the whole community, people are coming there to target? Are there like commercial fishing out in that area? Yep, there's commercial fishing for all the species, for stripers and squid and conch. There's, yeah. Yeah. Um, but in the fall, people try, we have a fishing derby here. It's five weeks long. And it just ended, actually. And people come from all over the world, really, actually, to fish it. Like, the whole island changes. It turns into this incredibly fishy place. Oh. Like, you go to a really, like, fancy restaurant. Everyone there is just talking about fishing. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> well, what's, the, what's the derby called? It's just called the derby. The striped bass and bluefish derby. It's been going on for 75 years. Wow, the Derby. Okay, and this is something. How do you, how do you take part in it? Well, I just guide it every day, um, which is really fun. I always, I don't know, I don't really fish it that much. Right. Uh, when I do, I'm just fishing to fish, not really to compete, and yeah. then I'm guiding. Gotcha. And the Derby is like what the biggest fish sort of thing, or how's the, how's the Derby work? Yeah, it's the biggest fish per species. They took striped bass out of it, thankfully, mm. um, two years ago, which is great. But they, it's the biggest fish per species and then the winner it's for a boat or a truck so like the people from shore who get the biggest species have a chance to win a truck a boat and then vice versa so it's like it's a huge deal on island the whole island goes crazy that is crazy. what who are the sponsors like who was the sponsors this year for the truck and the boat well this year there actually wasn't a truck (laughs) there wasn't a truck um the boat Actually, I don't know who the sponsor was. Or what was the, throughout the years, do you have different, like, was it like a Toyota one year and then it's Ford the next year or something like that? Uh, it was, there was like Subaru, there was Ford, there was, yeah. I mean, there's like all sorts of stuff. I don't know why, the last couple of years there hasn't been a truck sponsor, but the boat is awesome. Yeah, the boat's good. So it's a flat, and these are all for the most part like, a, well, probably not a flat style boat, but just. A... No, it had like a little cabin on it. It was cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the derby and then, and people are out there and on the derby, are they actually, is like, do they like kill a fish, bring it in and say, hey, here's my size? Or are they taking pictures? How's that look? Yeah, it's all catch and kill, which is a bummer. Yeah. Uh, but, because it's a lot of fish they take out of the water, but it's all catch and kill and they have, um, away in station so every night from seven to ten you bring your fish in 
and it gets weighed. And I mean, it's a really cool tradition. Yeah. But it's hard to see all this fish taken out of the water. Yeah. I think personally. Yeah. 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 It's hard in this. Uh, it is hard this day and age, right? You see all the ups and downs of populations in some of these areas and you hear the stories and see it sometimes in your own area. Um, especially the ocean, because sometimes you're like, well, what is exactly going on? Do we really know exactly what's going on out there in the ocean? And there's so many more factors too, like climate change and yep. stuff that these fish don't really have to deal with always. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's like throwing gas in the fire, I think a little bit. Right. Who's the, you mentioned a couple of groups, but who would be one group if folks wanted to like, um, connect or learn more about some of the conservation issues out there in the, in that area, who would they... Um, American Saltwater Guide Association is amazing. They break down all the policies and laws and things going on that are so hard to understand um, and break it down into a kind of like user-friendly document. Um, and they, they do a really, really, really great job. And they're doing the false albacore tagging um, mm. as well. So they've done a they They're great. And they're on Instagram. And they have a website and stuff. But if you follow them on Instagram, they like they're always promoting stuff every day. So oh, they are. Um, so they're promoting yeah. uh, just whatever thing you want to just like what's going on in the fishery or like um, you know what policies are coming up or need to be passed or gotcha. Um, yeah, they're great. Today's episode is sponsored by Zag Fish. Zag Fish. Right now, you can go over there, uh, not Zag but Zag Fish who was founded of the idea of finding ethical solutions to fly fishing and tying products and materials. This is the, uh, these are the owners of Fairflies, who we talked a lot about here, but they also have a bunch of other products over there, both conventional uh, gear, salt. They cover a lot of different things. The work they do uh, is working on creating jobs for protecting marginalized people and groups around the U.S. and abroad. And, uh, and they just got some stuff going, everything from their 5D brushes, which we've talked about, it's all good stuff, and people are loving fair flies. So you got to check out uh, what they have going at Zag. They also own Wasatch Custom Angley Tools, who are carrying on the tradition of making uh, heirloom quality fly tying tools with over 50 of these over there. A true do-it-yourself company. Been loving connecting with Jeff and the crew uh, over the years here, and it's good to share the message and what they have going. Right now, if you head over to wetflyswing.com slash Zag, that's Z-A-G right now, wetflyswing.com slash zag check it out right now to support this podcast get some killer tools and support a great local company right now well we've kind of come full circle i guess a little bit but i'm looking at i was kind of hoping to touch on a little bit of you know fishing off the beach which sounds like you get to the beach and you you get your gear and you go out there and you just make a cast find a spot you think there's a drop off and it's not super super difficult to find fit and you're not are you necessarily targeting one species or are you just casting out there and saying hey I'll, I'll maybe get one of these species yeah they all hang out together um so you're really you're i mean you're in a way targeting them with like if you're using a big huge clouser and doing a single hand strip i mean an albi or a bonito may eat that but probably not you know so when i go out this time of year in the fall at least i put on smaller a smaller fly like a clouser or something um because all four species will eat that and they hang gotcha. out together and same in the spring like when it's just stripers and blues you're targeting both of them they hang out all together so when you and when you're on the boat same thing you're you're I mean, you've got things dialed a little bit, but you, there might be multiple species in that same feeding line just going for it. Yeah, once you like, once you see them break the water, you know. But um, in the rips, it's you'll, you can get all four. But the flats are stripers. Okay, nice. Well, uh, I mean, when you look at the overall, just the experience of somebody who's getting ready for this, what would you be telling somebody if they were, say, again, coming in from you know somewhere on the other side of the country, and they're like, okay, I want to get, I want to do this thing. What, what do you tell them to prepare for the trip? I mean, if they want to do flats fishing, I would tell them to, not that you can't get fish if you don't have a great or long cast on the flats, because it's actually via boat, but, um, cause you can get kind of close, but you know, to prep your cast and your double haul, because we, it is the ocean. So we, it is windy. Mm -hmm. Um, so the double haul helps for sure. Mm -hmm. Not saying you have to have it and we love teaching it as well. A lot of clients, I actually will give like a casting lesson the day or two before if they're coming for a few days. Oh, nice. Um, and so we can just like get the kinks out 
and they can practice the double haul or learn the double haul or even learn to cast some people. Yeah. And um, then you can spend the whole time, you know, on the guided trip just fishing. But we love to teach, so it doesn't – that's not a necessity, but – so somebody coming in there that literally doesn't know how to cast barely or doesn't at all versus somebody who's like an ex- expert saltwater fisherman. Is there, what would be the difference in their experience with you uh, on, you know, this week? Would it be, would they both have a chance, plenty of fish or how's that look? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think if I would urge them maybe to, if they've never fished and they wanted to do a boat trip, I would probably urge them to do a casting lesson first. Um, and, or if they just wanted to like learn the fishery and the cast and stuff, we would probably do a shore trip because the shore fishing is really good on um, this time of year, but it just like takes the element of the boat out. So, you know, instead of we're focusing on standing and in the wind and blah, blah, you know, you're on the beach and you're, you're learning that way. Yeah. You're out there doing it. What is the, you know, if we had to nail you down and say, you know, out of the four, you can only pick one for the rest of your time. Which one are you going, are you going to take? Oh my gosh, that is a hard one. <laughs> well, maybe I guess stripers because I love the flats. Okay. And like and the rips, so you can do, you know, it's more. You can do two different types of fishing for them, but like catch, there's nothing cooler and more exhilarating than and like adrenaline than catching an albie. Yeah. I mean, they're crazy. Right. They're so fun. And it's so fun seeing clients' reactions after they land in Albi. They're like, holy shit, that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great. It's so fun. Like, they're so, you can talk about how crazy it is. And then when you actually do it, there, no one is ever like, oh, yeah, that was like kind of cool. Yeah. Like, that's never been said. I don't right. Think. <laughs> right. They're like, that was the best ever. That's it. So it's between Albies and Stripers. Those are, those are the two yes, you'd be. And then, definitely. And then you're, you're kind of right because Albies, that's the thing. You're not getting him in on the flats, Roy. No, not. I mean, you'll see him sometimes on the flats, but they look like they're like rabid fish because they're so fast. Yeah. So like, all right. like blue bullets, like brrr, all over. Yeah. Like, oh my God. That is, that's sweet. And then, and what about the size? So again, I can't remember if you mentioned this, but size of the, like what, just overall, what would be a monster uh, false abacore? And then what's the size, the average you're getting there? I mean, average is like probably like seven pounds. Yeah. Like 24 inches or so, 23 inches, yeah. something like that. A big, any like double digit. Um, that's big. Yeah, it's like kind of like the same as bonefish in the way. Like a twelve pound bonefish is a big. Bone. Right. Yeah. So you're not getting a. You're not seeing like a fifty pound ab, a false abacore. No. Out yeah. No. 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 Not here. Not there. But in other places, you might be. Down south, like they get bigger albies. Not fifty pounds, but bigger no. than twelve or fourteen. But I mean, gotcha. honestly, like even a small alby will bring you to your backing. Yeah. Quickly. So like, it almost doesn't matter. I mean, it does, but. They're just like such crazy fish regardless. Yeah, that sounds fun. I, I guess if I'm looking at it, what would I pick? So back to me, you know, I don't know. Again, I think, yeah, it'd be tough because, you know, striper, well, even the bluefish. I mean, that'd be kind of cool to have a fish that's like wants to bite your hand. Oh, yeah, they're crazy. Yeah, and then Bonito is the one. Is Are Bonito a little bit smaller than uh, false albacore? Uh, no, they're, they're about the same exact size, actually. About the same. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty similar. Yeah. If people are coming there and staying, are a lot of people coming to uh, Martha's Vineyard and staying on the island, or do a lot of people just come in for the day, do the ferry thing when they're fishing? We do both. Uh, we pick a lot of people up at the at the ferry, um, but a lot of people come and stay for a few days because it's because our fishery is so diverse, and because we have an amazing shore fishery and boat fishery, many people will come in and do one trip of each, mm. um, unless it's like way better from shore, way better from boat. We'll usually urge them that way, but a lot of people will do one of each just to experience it. One of um, each. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's definitely a different experience. Both. Yeah. It sounds like if you're going to do it, especially if you're coming in for a way, I mean, it'd be nice to be there for uh yeah. I mean, a week would be great. Right. Just to hang out and, and yeah, uh, it's so fun. Yeah. What is, what makes Martha's video? I mean, again, you know, everybody's heard of it. But what is it, what, like, what else is there to do? What are people, if they're not fly fishing or fishing, what else are they doing there? I mean, there's beautiful towns. There's seven towns on island. So there's, you know, there's kind of a lot in that regard where a lot of other islands have, like, Nantucket is one town. Mm. 
Um, so we have seven towns. There's really beautiful hiking here. Oh, okay. Uh, really lovely hiking and mountain biking and stuff. Um, but the beaches here are pretty incredible. They're all sandy and up island. There's actually these big clay cliffs that are super beautiful. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of outdoor activities here. Yeah. But there's also amazing restaurants and like fun bars and cool little shops and right. there's no chains on island it's ever one dairy queen which is hilarious and stop and shop oh there's a dairy queen there's one dairy queen it's like oh my god it's it's right now it's near the shop it's so funny oh, right. it's like <laughs> right. all the kids in school like take an afternoon from school and walk there it's like oh, a thing it's like god. the one chain right the one so chain easy. i don't even, i don't even think that's real ice cream that they serve there i don't think it's some... no i'm like there's so many good like local ice cream yeah but I think it's just the fact that it's a chain, but in that way, it's cool because there's a lot of small local businesses on island. So, you know, the shops are really cool. Oh, right. So, yeah. So, and, and the fly fishing, when you look at it, is that a, just a tiny, just like, you know, just a tiny little fraction of people on out there you're seeing with, is, or is it like just you and a few other people or is there actually a decent? Oh, it's growing like oh, crazy. There's huge fly fishing culture out here, which is so cool. And spin, and we like if clients want to come and do spin on the boat, like no problem at all. We have spin gear and stuff too. Um, but just our shop is only fly. But no, there's a big community here of fishermen. It's really, it's like definitely part of the island's culture is fishing. It is 100%. Oh, it is. Yeah, 100%. it is. So whether it's fly oh, yeah. fishing or whatever, it's it's fly definitely... fishing or spin fishing, 100 tuna fishing. Gotcha. Yeah. And you probably, yeah. And if you look at the history, I'm sure it's always been right. Fishing has always been. Always. I started with whaling and, um, but you know, that's, yeah. Yeah. Clamming and everything. All that. I always assume with Martha's video, not knowing any of the background, I didn't do obviously much research for it, but you know, it's like, um, yeah, I don't know what I thought, you know, I guess there is, are there some like, uh, I mean, there are higher end things like, is it like the present? Is there something out there? Like there's some right, the like, um, higher level stuff. Do you know anything about that? I'm just curious, because that was always my perspective that it was kind of a upper level where you needed a lot of money to go out to some of these places, but it doesn't sound like that's the case here. No, the vineyard is a really interesting place where like, there definitely is the like, wealthiest of wealthy and that yeah that's right so you have that you have the wealthiest totally but then there's like it's also the, one of the poorest counties in massachusetts and there's like a com there's you know locals like me that are fishing <laughs> yeah <laughs> or you know clamming for a living or whatever like there's it's a very diverse in that way it's kind of it's actually pretty crazy Right. The difference. That's what I was thinking. I mean, that, that was my perspective is that it's like, oh, yeah, you do. I've never heard anything. Uh, well, I've heard, obviously heard stuff about the fishing, but it's always been like, yeah, this is I'd imagine people go in there, have lots of money. It's like, you know, but it sounds like it's actually a lot cooler than that. It's actually there's some really uh, cool like a local economy or a local vibe there. Oh, and the thing, too, is like it's a pretty big island. So it's a, I mean, it's a year on space. So it's not. There's de I mean, it's a tourist destination, of course. It's a whole different island in the winter. But um, because there's seven towns, there's huge farms. Like, it's a totally self-sustaining kind of economy, which mm. is cool. Um, big far like, local big farms. But, yeah, you know, like, there's agriculture out here. There's, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for taking us down. That was just uh, was an interesting little fun fact. And. So after you finish up the season, so when are you, are you actually heading out of there uh, and heading out to another uh, part of the country? So I live on island year round, um, but I do a bunch of hosted travel trips in the winter. Mm -hmm. So I bring groups down to the Bahamas and Mexico and Belize and Argentina. Um, this year we're going down to the Bahamas for two different trips, Belize and Mexico, hmm. which will be good. Yep. Gotcha. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah. What's the Mexico trip? Um, Mexico's Punta Allen. Mm -hmm. And then the, I, I'm really excited about the Bahama trip, which is on the Berry Islands. And it's just like a, such a cool fishery. It's I mean, I'm excited about all of them, but the Bahama trip is like super fun. Yeah. How is the Bahamas different from Martha's Vineyard? You know, that experience. You know, it's kind of funny, actually. <laughs> like, any island is an island. Like, at the end of the day, you hang out with guides. They're all talking about the same thing that we're all talking about at the end of the right. day. Like, the drama of the island is the same down there. It's, like, so funny. Island cultures are, like, 
regardless, like no matter where you are in the world, I feel like obviously there's differences, but it's like there's such an island culture anywhere you go. It's so funny. Um, but the fishing down there is really cool. So we do full day trips down there. I don't guide. I just host the trips, like bring okay. clients down and then use local guides. Um, and we stay at a lodge and I organize everything and, um, they go out, we go out for, you know, full day trip and have lunch out on the boat. And then you come back around four and there's cool happy hour and it's right on the beach. And then there's dinner and, you know, everyone just slapping stories. And yeah. the cool thing that I'm really excited about the Bahama trip is, um, it's a pretty diverse group of some anglers have been fishing forever and some just started this year. Some just started this fall actually. And both men and women. And so it's, it's really cool that there's a, it's a cool group of people going. Because everybody, the Bahamas is one of those spots, one of those bucket lists, right? If that's everybody wants to get. Yeah. It. Yeah. And it's pretty doable. It's pretty, as far as getting out there, that's uh, probably as easy as any of these kind of uh, island type trips. Super easy. You can fly out of Fort Lauderdale to the Barry Islands directly, or you can go from uh, to Nassau and then get on a teeny little plane and hop over. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's super easy. Yeah, super easy. Nice. Well, we'll have to uh, leave. I, I wanted to touch, you know, just on a little bit of that Montana. It sounds like you don't do as much of that. I mean, that was more of your early, and now you're really focused on. Sounds like salt for the most part. Do you still get out to like do any freshwater stuff these days? Yeah, I love freshwater fishing. Um, I host trips out to Montana too, and I know Montana is like will always be a part of me. I love it. Um, Western Mass has amazing saltwater or sorry freshwater fishing i sometimes work with harrison anglers they're buddies of mine they're amazing guides uh on in western mass um and it's just like it's such a cool fishery but i definitely am like focused uh, i grew up on the salt most i mean and fresh i guess but i just have always loved the salt because you go out there you don't necessarily know what you're gonna find like you see crazy like giant sunfish or turtles or whales or sharks i mean it's so cool yeah it's cool it's uh so Western Mass, I was just looking at, um, again, I'm trying to do my my geography thing, but that's amazing. Massachusetts is obviously such a big uh, a big state. What, what was the name of that, that um, the shop there you mentioned, Harris? Um, they don't have a shop. They're just a guide service, Harrison Anglers. They're awesome. They're like very good friends of mine, and they're incredible guides. Oh, cool. They guided out the same place I guided in Montana, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put a link to that them in the show notes and anything else we covered here today. And uh, nice. Well, before we get out of here, anything else we missed? I mean, if somebody's getting ready for one of these things, you know, anything else you would kind of tell them or any tips on preparing for a, a trip out to Martha's Vineyard? Um, just practice that cast in the wind because it, it can be. I mean, today, for example, there's zero knots of wind, but it can be windy. Um, and just come with like a patient attitude because saltwater fishing can be tricky, but it's so fun. And anyone that has questions at all or wants to know more about the fishery or anything, just call me or email me. I'm happy to share tips or information or anything at all. So please tell everyone to reach out if they have questions. We'll do that. And we'll put a, a link in the show notes to that, uh, kissmitoutfitters.com. And uh, and then, yeah, for you, I mean, as you look out, you, I think you kind of mentioned the next kind of six months or so, you're just getting ready for wrapping this up. And what, was it late November you kind of wrap up the vineyard? Yeah, wrap up. The shop will stay open year round, but like guiding is like not work, it feels like to me. Mm. It's just like so fun. But it's like getting to the point of guiding. So it's, we do trade shows and we do bookings all winter long and reordering for the shop and do tying nights at the shop and oh yeah um you know so yeah. it's like it's definitely slower we're not guiding but it's just prepping for the next season do you have uh on the salt water do you when you look back because you did quite a bit of fresh water like montana guide what does that look for you is it is there a big difference between is one more challenging than the other uh salt water i think is more challenging because like fish won't travel kind of you know not always but they'll stay in the same hole for a little while or under that same log for a little mm. while where like fish are never stop moving in the ocean. So they're, they're every day is a new day. Every single day is different. Yeah. Which is cool. Right. Keeps you busy. So salt is the harder one. I, I've always loved that question because I've done a little bit of guiding and I know how difficult it is. So I always love to hear, cause there's some people like you that you hear them talk like, Oh man, 
I love this thing. It's almost, it sounds almost easy, right? Even though I know it's not, but then there's some people like me, it was like, man, I was always stressed out, making sure like I would get people into fish, right? It was always, I guess I, I put overburden on myself. Do you find yourself doing that at all? Oh yeah. I mean, clients are like, I really want to catch a fish. I'm like, I definitely want you to catch a fish way more than you want. To. Yeah. Right. <laughs> way more than you want to. Um, but you know, part of it too is like, obviously that's our main goal, but it's also showing them like the fishery here is incredible and the being out on the ocean and teaching them about the environment and the ocean and the, it's just like a whole experience, which that's what I try to provide as well. Cause you can't really control the fishing always. Um, but I feel like a day in the water, if your cast can improve or you learn something new or you get to see a new part of the world, like when I get guided, if I don't catch a fish, but get that out of it, I feel like it was a good day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not about, yeah, it's not about the catching, although it is nice to get, get into the fish you're going for. Oh yeah. I mean, that's the main goal. And sometimes I get a little too into it, but you know, right that's on. part of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Abby, well, I'll, I'll send, like I said, send everybody out to uh, kissmitoutfitters.com if they have questions and they can connect with you. And hopefully, yeah, down the line, maybe we could put together a crew to come out and uh, and check out the vineyard. That'd be awesome. But uh, yeah. Oh, that'd be so fun. Yeah, that'd be the best. That'd be great. I would love to. I, I mean, there's so much, like you said, I mean, you got that whole East Coast. There's up and down. There's tons of fresh water. And, and now you add the salt here, which makes it pretty cool. So yeah, thanks again for all the time today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was awesome. So there it is wetflyswing.com slash 381, 381. If you go over there right now, you get a bunch of bonuses. Uh, we've got uh, a transcript, the full transcript. So if you have any questions that came up in this episode and you want to find out exactly where that is, easy way, just go down there at the bottom of that post, of the blog post, and you could search and find exactly what you're talking about. Before we get out of here, another shout out to Peter Mraz from Augusta, Georgia, who won the big trip. We also, on the live event that we gave away uh, we actually announced four bonus winners on that trip. So we gave away four other products, um, and it was a, just a fun time. About 30 minutes there, we busted through that um, and just connected with some people, had a bunch of uh, some questions. So we're going to keep that going as we go. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you get a chance, you can uh, connect with me online, uh, anywhere, Wet Fly Swing, or send me an email, Dave, at Wet Fly Swing, anytime. We're going to have lots of these events coming up here, and I would love to get with you on the water and, uh, and get out there and do some fishing. Um, and if I can't do that, definitely, like I say, wet fly swing, connect with me online. Definitely hope you are having a good afternoon, a great evening, or if it's morning, hope you're having a great morning and uh, maybe a great cup of coffee. And I hope to connect with you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.